In the final homestand of the final season at Yankee Stadium, Jarek Jeter now ranks first in the most hits in the Cathedral of Baseball. His first inning single knocked Lou Gehrig's name from the top spot, eclipsing a record that stood since 1937. I'm with Evan Longoria, and Evan, pretty much everything you've touched this year has turned to gold, including this team. How great has this year been for you? Things have fallen into place perfectly for the Red Sox, who are on the verge of going to the ALCS for the fourth time in six years. They have a 2-0 series lead. They are back at home where they posted the second best mark in baseball. And oh yeah, Josh Beckett is on the mound. Welcome to the MLB.com studios in New York City. I'm Paul Dev along with our resident GM, Jim Duquette. And the Tampa Bay Rays make history as they win their first ever playoff game, beating the Chicago White Sox 6-4. Wow, what a day in Philadelphia. More than 2 million fans lined the streets of Philadelphia and filled not one, but two stadiums to celebrate the city's first championship in 25 years. The Philadelphia Phillies bringing home the World Series title after beating the Tampa Bay Rays four games to one in the 2008 World Series. The Boston Red Sox are getting some help for the pennant chase. The team acquired Mark Kotze from the Atlanta Braves for a minor leaguer. The deal had been held up until the Red Sox and Kotze could agree on the assignment fee owed to the veteran outfielder under his contract. Boston needed another outfielder after J.D. Drew went on the DL on Tuesday with a bad back. Kotze hit 289 with six home runs and 37 RBIs for the Braves. In return for Kotze, the Braves will get Luis Somoza, a 19-year-old outfielder who played for the Red Sox Class A affiliate in Lowell. Kotze hopes to arrive in the Bronx in time for Wednesday night's game with the Yankees. After 42 starts, are you finally starting to feel like you're coming into your own as a frontline starter? Yeah, I feel uh, I feel a lot more uh, comfortable out there. You know, early in the year, uh, I didn't have the you know the greatest results. Uh, I feel a lot more confident out there and a lot more uh, comfortable. Carlos Delgado said that you used to be a guy who would throw 100 pitches by the fourth inning. Now he said you're a guy that gets mad just when you throw a ball. What's been the difference? I, I think the, the the whole mindset of of you know being confident and and knowing uh, and trusting myself and knowing. With Red Sox, GM Theo Epstein, and Theo, every year there are challenges, and this year's no different. You had to deal with a lot of injuries, the Manny saga, but you guys have not skipped a beat. Is that a testimony to the character and the makeup of this team? Yeah, I think the players' character uh, deserves a lot of credit. They've battled through a lot of adversity this year, from the Japan trip early to a lot of key injuries. And I think you know the best way to overcome injuries as an organization is to have a lot of depth in your minor league system, so the upper levels are full of guys who can come and and step in, whether it's two weeks or two months, keep you afloat. Now, in 2004, you traded one of the best players in franchise history, in Omar Garcia Parra, which took a lot of guts. That worked out well. Did that experience help you in terms of pulling the trigger on the Manny trade, knowing that you had to trade a great player for the best of the team? Uh, yeah, I think the Nomar trade maybe made this Manny situation easier on me from a personal standpoint, but I think they were, uh, they're distinct examples from an organizational standpoint. Really, it's the principle of uh, team first and you know, not, being, not being afraid to make any move if it's, if it's in the best interest of the organization. Now, when you draft a player or trade for a player, a lot of research goes into whether or not they can handle the Boston media and the market. Jason Bay was a guy who played in a small market for many years, didn't play a lot of meaningful games. Are you surprised the way he's been able to handle the Boston pressure and do this well this soon? Right. Well, there's two ways to look at it. There's, you know, well, he's been in a small market, so he hasn't, you know, who knows if he can succeed in a big market. We can also look at it that, you know, he's never really played meaningful baseball games late in the year and he might be energized by being on this kind of stage. Now when you took over the Red Sox you made it a point to improve the minor league system and you've done that and you were adamant about not trading away the great prospects. Do you take a lot of satisfaction in seeing the guys like Dustin Pedroia, Ellsbury, Pavelbon come up and have great success? Yeah I think we take a lot of pride in that as an organization. You know it's a organization-wide effort from top to bottom and you know, it, it's our preferred way to build teams, but it's starting to become the only viable way to build teams given uh, the fact that fewer and fewer great players are getting to free agency. If you don't have a constant pipeline of impact level talent coming through your system, it can be really challenging regardless of your payroll. Do you have any regrets about trading Manny at all? Obviously, he's a Hall of Fame player. Yeah. He, no regrets, but he's a great player and, and um, a special part of Red Sox history, the way Nomar was too. And, we never want to take away from what they did when they were here. It wasn't easy to trade them, 
Um, you know, at the same time, he's in a good place where he's playing really well and trying to bring the Dodgers into the playoffs, and we're happy with the way it turned out for us. Has this been the most challenging, one of the most challenging years for you? Because you really, you've had to change on the fly, character, chemistry. After the trading deadline, you pick up Paul Bird, you pick up Mark Conte. Has this been a challenge for you? Um, it's been a challenge for the organization, but you know, we were fortunate in that those injuries occurred. Um, at a time when there were good players like Bird and Kotze still available through the waiver wire in 06. We had half our team go down, it seemed like the day after the trading deadline, and there wasn't much we were able to do. So that was probably a more challenging time, and it was the one year we didn't make the playoffs. So maybe we learned a few lessons from that year. Okay, Theo, thanks a lot. Thanks, Paul. Appreciate Seeing you. Okay. Here is the cast and crew, Jen Sturger, the numbers are Rob DeAngelis, Kobe Superfan, Reese Waters, <laughs> and our special guest today, Paul Devlin, former pro baseball player and a former and a longtime Major League Baseball analyst. Hey, great to be here. And I, and I need to know, Ocho Cinco and birth control? <laughs> he said he was as dependable, 99.9% uh, uh, .9 dependable. <laughs> After missing 100% of the OTAs. <laughs> That's a good story. Yeah. yeah. And they both go across the middle. <laughs> oh, wow. That was awesome. good. Let's turn He's the uh, conversation yeah. quickly <laughs> to baseball. Let's talk about interleague play. I mean, say what you will about it, Paul. It's certainly can be said that's been played out or that's completely unnecessary but I think starting tonight you'd have to say it's at least adding some juice with some very big series yeah Yankees and the Phillies I mean who wants to see the Yankees and the Orioles one more time this is great there are a I lot do. of people out Yankees there Yankees fans. Yeah, Yankees fans. exactly there are a lot of people out there that don't like it I love it gives you a chance to see some of these players that you haven't been able to see during the course of the year yep let's talk about that game Yanks Phils perhaps the most significant game it took place in the Bronx Rematch World Series from last year. Let's take a look at the highlights. Yankees, Phillies. All right, CC Sabathia and Roy Halladay. Aces wild on the mound, but it was not going well for Halladay early in this one. Halladay owns the Yankees, 18 and six lifetime, but he just didn't have it early against the Yankees in this one. Brett Gardner touching him up there. It was two nothing, then three nothing. Now in the bottom of the third. Oh, your boy Nick Swisher. Bam! But this was kind of a theme today. You know, it's usually the Phillies hitting long balls in their own park, but today, and you see Mark Teixeira going deep. This is six innings, six earned runs off eight hits for Halliday. Yeah, Halliday just didn't have it. Mark Teixeira, he's gotten off to a very slow start. Good to see him back, get those power numbers up. So 8-3 is the final. The Yanks go on to a comfortable win. I know it's been a bad month, obviously, for the Phillies. Bad pitching night, but it's for Halliday. But in the past, it's really been some bad hitting that's plagued the Phillies. Yeah, you can't panic though right now. I mean, this is a team that has been through the wars over the past two years, getting to the World Series and winning it, getting back to it last year. Every team goes through bad stretches during the season. Right now, the Phillies are having bad stretches. Ryan Howard, Jason Worth. Chase Utley just not doing the job. Obviously, they have some pressure on them. Jimmy Rollins, I think, is the key. He has been out. He is the catalyst of that team. He is a difference maker. When you take an MVP out of the lineup, it's going to make a difference. He sets the table for that team. He ignites that offense. When he comes back, it will be a different Phillies team. Let's talk about the AL East. Right now, the Yankees, they've been trailing Tampa for so long, but now they're right there at the top of them. Your guy's been in Boston for a long time covering the Sox. We'll see the standings right here, the New York Yankees, then Tampa Bay, then Boston. Only four games back for the Red Sox right now, and some people believe that the Red Sox are probably the third best team in the entire American League. But are they going to be on the way? Uh, are they going to be out the outside looking in? I don't think so, because the Red Sox right now, all the problems that they had this year, the injuries, David Ortiz getting off to a terrible start, Josh Beckett hurt, <clears throat> Jacoby Ellsbury, Mike Cameron, they have filled the gaps, players coming up from the minor leagues, they've turned it around, Clay Buchholz doing a tremendous job in the starting mm -hmm. rotation, and really, Theo Epstein, I think, is the best general manager in the game in terms of making those big moves at the trade deadline. We saw him trade Nomar Garcia Parra, we saw him trade Manny Ramirez, I mean, you're talking about two icons in Boston. Doesn't mind being unpopular with exactly. the Exactly. Yeah. And I mean, those were huge risks, and he will improve this club at the trade deadline. The Boston minor league farm system has a lot of tremendous prospects. He has a lot to work with. This team, it's a veteran team, and I really think that they're going to be in it at the end. Don't count out Baltimore. 
I'm yeah. kidding. Count on both. <laughs> yeah. uh, the story in baseball right now is that Steven Strasburg imported some illegal filth, brought it into Major League Baseball. <laughs> Triple X. Unbelievable. <laughs> X-rated stuff. Endo rush stuff. Unbelievable. <laughs> a couple of questions. When will they ban his curveball? And what took him so long to bring him up? This is a team that won 57 games last year. Right. It was all about the Benjamins, of course, because if they brought him up, his clock would start ticking in terms of going to arbitration. So they bring him up in June. They delay that a little bit. The San Francisco Giants got burned by that with Tim Lincecum. They brought him up earlier. They wound up paying him $12, $13 million, the contract that he just signed. But I think they did a good job in terms of developing him, bringing up through the minor league system, and then bringing him up to face a team like the Pirates and the Indians. Of course, the Pirates, with all due respect, they're not the Yankees. But it was a great situation to put Strasburg in at home, facing a team like the Pirates, where he can get his feet wet, comfortable, and he was just unbelievable. I mean, he is a pitcher that I have to watch. Go home, wherever I am, turn the TV on, and watch him pitch. Because as a former catcher, watching this guy and how he works, it's unbelievable. He has four great pitches. Two-seam fastball, four-seamer, unbelievable curveball, and a changeup that's at 92 miles an hour, which is flat-out scary. And you're giving all due respect to Pittsburgh. I am. Which is a first and last on this program. Yeah, and supporting yeah. Reese's uh, Strasburg propaganda. Thank you very much for that. Well, let's talk about more of the pitching in the National League. Pitching has really ruled the day in baseball this year. But in the National League, you have Jimenez, you have Kane, and, and Josh Johnson, who are actually pitching out of their heads right now, gems every time out. Why do you think pitching performance in baseball has been so great so far? And of those guys, who's the best pitcher in the NL? I think Jimenez right now. And it's not a situation where he just burst onto the scene. He was a very good pitcher last year. 98 mile an hour fastball, but it's not just 98 miles and straight. A lot of people throw upwards of, I'm not saying a lot, but in the high 90s, but they throw straight. This guy's fastball moves unbelievable. He's got great command, great breaking pitch, and he has the body to pitch over the long haul. You're not going to see a guy like him break down over the course of the year. And is it the absence of steroids that's contributed to this new pitching-dominated league? I think it has helped because if you look at the home runs, they are way down from previous years when baseball started implementing this testing. So I think that is a big key to it. I also think that there are a lot of great hitters in the league, but there's not a lot of great hitting teams. Mm. You don't see those guys like the Red Sox when they had Manny Ramirez and David Ortiz. You just don't have that. Teams and pitchers can pitch around guys and face the weaker hitters in the orders. I think that has something to do with it as well. Like Rob mentioned, there's been a lot of great pitching, a lot of perfect games, but the one that stands out, of course, in everybody's mind, Jim Joyce, Galarraga incident. Don't you think that's the perfect argument that there needs to be, you know, expand the use of instant replay? I think it should be expanded, but not for situations like that. Because you take the human element out of the game, and then you have the umpire saying, well, if I blow the call, we'll just go to instant replay. That's not how it works in baseball. You can't go back and change or overturn these calls. I think no it's readers. great. <laughs> I think it's great for home runs, and I really think that they will expand it for the postseason. But I just don't think they should use it during the year. I think it just takes the human element out of the game. But see, I don't understand that argument because we have like radar systems that keep us safe when we fly. That took the human element out of <laughs> flying. And I appreciate it. <laughs> I understand. I understand. But you know, you saw the NBA game the other day between the Celtics and the Lakers. There was three calls right in a row. They went to the video replay. Mm -hmm. What did it do to the flow of the game? It Get ruined it right. the flow of the game. And, and okay? a, you can't do as that. As long as it's in favor you of the Lakers, he doesn't do that. Get that. In baseball, that the games are long enough as they are. Hmm. Blame and the I, Yankees. Yes, I, well. and the Red Sox, <laughs> according to Joe West. Right. But I just think that, you know, you got to keep the human element in the game. Get it right with the home runs, and I think they will expand it to the postseason. But I don't think that you can have this replay for plays at the plate. I mean, you take the human element out of the game. It's been part of the game since it started. And I don't think we should see expanded replay during the regular season. Let's call it the imperfect game. And where does it end, Reese? You saw Terminator, too. I did. It can't all be about the machines. <laughs> Paul, thanks so much for coming on. Bill Belichick demands that his players be tough and resilient in the face of adversity. He expects them to stay focused when the world around them is falling apart. And he wants only those who put the team before everything else. On Sunday, Belichick lived by his law, going to work after his father's death. 
you know, coach this game with a heavy heart. Um, my dad passed away. I found out about it in the middle of last night. Um, you know, obviously, he had a tremendous influence on my life personally, uh, and particularly in the football aspect. It was great to be able to share some of the tremendous memories uh, with him and some of our recent successes. Belichick didn't share his feelings with his team before the game. To use it as motivation would have gone against everything that Belichick stood for. The son did as his father would have wanted him to, and he coached the team while dealing with incredible pain, something that moved every member of the Patriots. He uh, just made mention of it to the team after he said his comments about the game, and uh, you know there was a, a sigh for him, and, and I think everyone realizes uh, how tough that would be. You know, just the incredible, just the way he's there for us. He's there through, through everything, through thick and through thin. You know, it's, it's something that, you know, we all have incredible respect for him for that. And uh, we, we, we try to let him realize after the game that we're here for him. And, uh, you know, we're, we're going to miss his father. Steve Belichick was the coach's coach, the father who taught his son everything he knew about the game. He watched Bill flourish into one of the game's best innovators and motivators, his place in the Hall of Fame assured. Last February, for the first and only time, they'd share the national spotlight producing an image that most fans will never forget. On Saturday night, Steve Belichick died a football man through and through. You know, yesterday he did what he enjoyed doing. He went and watched Navy play, watched them win. Uh, some of his former players were there, uh, had dinner and spoke with them after the game. And uh, like he normally does Saturday night, sitting around watching college football. And um, it's hard to stop beating. So I'm sure that's the way he would want it at the end. Bill Belichick will honor his father using the lessons he learned along the way. He will coach as his father would have wanted him to with a steely resolve and a laser-like focus that has made him the best coach in the game. Reporting for Sports Desk, I'm Paul Devlin.